Hi, my name is Susie Lessoff, and I'm the coordinator of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. I'd like to welcome everybody who's in the room and everybody online. It's really exciting for us to be hosting a live meeting, and it's also exciting to see quite how many people have joined us from across Europe. We know we have a real range of um, countries represented, and we're really grateful that um, you're taking part. We hope there'll be space for you to contribute later. We're going to have three speakers, and then the panel, right, I don't know if you can see where the panel are here, and we're going to pause when the panel starts to give you a chance to say your thoughts and to make some contributions. And again, at the end, we'll have a discussion. Today is the last day of the European Public Health Week, which is an initiative of the European Public Health Association, UFA, and that's fostering collaboration amongst the health, public health community across Europe. And Dinika, Anna, Micah, we'll hear from you a little bit later. But we're really honoured to partner with you for today's theme, which is building resilient health systems. Public Health Week so far has looked at vaccines, health literacy, climate change and mental health and really issues through the life course. But we felt that it was important also to remember the contribution that health systems make to public health. We think that there is a strong link between how we keep the population healthy and how we keep the health system functioning. Um, I wanted to just tell you before we started, though, a tiny bit about the observatory. And if I could make the slide happen. We're basically a partnership um, that brings together the European Commission. So we'll hear later from Maya, WHO, Natasha will join us and give us a presentation or not, depending on the connection, member states. And what we try to do is work together to understand the evidence on what's happening in health systems and to present that evidence so that policymakers can make better decisions. We have a really wide range of perspectives, so I can't go through all the partners, but if you think that the countries beginning with S are Slovenia, Spain, Sweden and Switzerland, you'll see that that's really a, a mix of inputs. And we do country monitoring, analysis, performance assessment and knowledge brokering with a very specific sense that people should be making the best informed decisions that we can. Um, and we feel that, that around health systems and public health, there are so many issues that really need evidence to support them. The pandemic has highlighted new challenges and also really the long-standing underlying issues that health systems face. And so we want to consider what we do now, but also in the long term to address these and to build resilience. So I will pass over now to Giuseppe Figueres, who is the director of the observatory, if I may, to say a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Oops, backwards a bit. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Susie. Welcome everybody live and online. What I wanted to do in 10 minutes or so is bring you a bit of a framework towards resilience. Today, we're going to focus on three aspects of resilience. We're going to focus on health systems aspects of resilience. We're going to talk about access issues. We're going to talk about digital, we're going to talk about the health workforce. But my presentation is to give you a broader understanding of resilience. Uh, uh, so we, you link other strategies to the strategies we're looking, we're looking at today. So I call it preliminary reflections. First, a kind of appetizer. Uh, we've been doing a, a lot of work on the subject uh, based on this platform, the Health Systems uh, uh, Response Monitor that looked at, reviewed, and monitored the response of member states uh, to the COVID. And uh, the main work basically is summarized in the Red Book, uh, which is edited by a number of colleagues. Anna Sagan is here as the first editor. But then we published uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, this public, two of these publications are, the central publications actually are with the WHO and the European Commission. We did a number of EuroHealth, our journal, looking at various aspects of governance. The last one, the last year of health actually was with the French presidency, was presented to all uh, ministers of health of the European Union. And we looked at uh, resilience and the role of the European Health Union, which we're going to hear a bit more later on uh, from Maya. Finally, we're very excited about this special issue of health policy that also caters to the researchers, looking at some of the research uh, 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 behind uh, the health systems and resilience. So this is the kind of shopping list. Don't worry, I would love to spend the next few hours taking you through the, to the shopping list. This is 20 strategies that were identified in our research 
that explain the resilience of systems. They are context specific. It's not a, uh, a recipe, even if it looks as a recipe, because obviously context will make a difference. But these are strategies that in different contexts, we felt strengthen the capacity of the health system to respond to the crisis, to the COVID crisis, but future crisis. We define resilience, incidentally, as the ability of the system to deal and manage a shock, prepare for the shock in advance, and importantly, learning from the shock. So my presentation very much today is what have we learned from that shock? What kinds of strategies we learn for future shocks, be it COVID, be it a virus, be it many of the shocks, as we're hearing just today, we're talking about international food crisis, uh, secondary or explained by the Ukrainian crisis. That's bound to be a shock that may affect uh, the movement of migrants, may affect uh, uh, lots of pressure on our health systems. So these strategies are in a number of categories. I'll say a tiny bit on some of those, particularly a bit on governance, but we have in there, of course, finance. Universal coverage has been key. The ability to purchase together, to procure together, uh, as we've seen through the European uh, Union mechanisms, has been central. There's a lot to learn in future resilience in purchasing, procuring together, working together under the finance strategy. Health workforce, we'll hear more about health workforce in a minute. Public health, needless to say, particularly in this week, uh, the ability to, 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 to trace and track and respond to the crisis. And indeed, uh, a number of strategies around the delivery where we're going to be focusing a bit more today on the, this uh, theme of resilience of health systems. But perhaps a couple of messages at the very beginning, messages I keep repeating and I'm a bit bored. I'm, not being very original today, perhaps, but, but it's important to remind ourselves that the COVID-19 is only one shock. And I said that already, but I want to say it again and again and again. It's only one shock, which reminded us of problems of the health system that we knew about. Tell me how many of you have been so surprised about the crisis of the health workforce. Tell me how many of you are so surprised about that primary care was effective in access. How many of you are surprised about some of our uh, complexities in public health when the time arrived to respond to the crisis came to the full front? So it's a canary in the mind. Well, quite more than a canary, really. A canary, more than a bird, much, much more serious than that, that uh, reminded us of the vulnerabilities of the health system. But three themes that will be permeating, I hope, today in our debates. One, do we need to assess our health systems to be better prepared? And I'd like to highlight the work that we're doing with the European Commission, with the OECD and the observatory on measuring and assessing the health systems to have them prepare for future crises. Second theme, which will come up again and again, I hope, is how do we sustain, harness and implement the kind of innovation we saw. We saw lots of positive things during crisis in the ability of the health system to react. Can we reproduce some of that framework some of those conditions, without having COVID, of course, that allow the system to react and to respond to the crisis. So a lot is going to be the implementing and sustaining innovation. And indeed, a strong reminder, and Anna Sagan will remind us of that, of the links, but not only within the health system, but across other sectors. Resilience is not a health system issue alone, it's an issue that has to do as well with resilience in other sectors. A lot of our, um, a lot of our uh, work in that, in that volume, in this study, is around governance. Indeed, nine of the 20 strategies are around leadership and governance, which were key and essential to a good uh, and effective response of the health system. I don't have the time, I will not go into detail, but just a quick reminder, needless to say, political leadership, how do you do that? How do you steer that in future is difficult. Polit political leadership is what it is, uh, but it's been central in the ability of the health systems to be resilient, needless to say. A timely uh, strategy, there's been a lot of debate around uh, Asian countries like Singapore and so on that had experience with SARS and had ready-made strategies to react to COVID. Uh, monitoring and surveillance in the European Public Health Week, we don't need to say that, is central. And there's been lots of efforts in the right direction there and thanks also to the European Union efforts and the WHO efforts. Uh, coordination, we learn a lot about not only vertical but horizontal. Actually, if there is a case where we saw health in all policies, 
It's been the case of COVID, rightly or wrongly. I wish I had time to uh, thresh out some of the lessons around the coordination. A lot of the lessons uh, and coordination effectively is transparency and accountability. It matters less who takes the lead, centrally or decentralized, Ministry of Health or Prime Minister, as long the accountability and the transparency and the clarity and coordination is really, really well in place. Involving the stakeholders, and now let me take you just three of those very, very briefly, because I think they are particularly important in, the, in this meeting uh, today. Transferring evidence to policy, you, as in public health, the fundamental role we have is being knowledge brokers, transferring evidence to policy. We learned a lot about uh, transparency and communicating uncertainty creates trust, the ability to show that we don't know, and there's a lot that our policymakers did not know. So how do we communicate uncertainty is fundamental. The objectivity and the independence from the political process of these knowledge brokers and the multidisciplinarity. I was just this week uh, with the most famous biologist in the Netherlands who were both speaking at giving a keynote there. And what's quite a little interesting debate about uh, presenting COVID, presenting the challenges from the pure scientific perspective, as my colleague in the platform was saying, a very well-known virologist, and my argument which was, yes, virologists are very important, but we need sociologists, political scientists, economists, economists to be able to uh, communicate, to do knowledge program. It's not enough to have the vaccine. People need to be vaccinated. And why people don't vaccinate? because we're lousy at communicating, at explaining, and so on. Uh, Director General uh, Tedros is talking about we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. And we've seen a lot of dynamism, a lot of reaction, a lot of your community, our community in public health, in being much better in that infodemic, but not good enough. Here, uh, a reminder a reminder of this is the work of the Monti Commission, uh, established by, by WHO, but with key participants from member states and other organizations. A powerful reminder of international governance as central to resilience. Uh, the, 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 the welfare of the health systems, needless to say, will have to do on the ability to surrender. Sorry, this is politically incorrect, but I'll say it. I can say these things. Some of that subsidiarity bring that sovereignty together, otherwise we're not getting out of this or future crisis. And Ukraine, uh, for the better, has shown that actually countries have been able and prepared to surrender some pool, not surrender, pull some of that sovereignty. So for future resilience, that's going to be central. We have lots of initiatives in the European Health Union in that, reaction, in, that, in that domain, lots of initiatives also in the strengthening the health system beyond the COVID, the recent Slovenian presidency put together a number of instruments there to strengthen health systems and even instruments of the European Union. And in the same way, the WHO, the WHO initiatives have been central. The pandemic treaty will be key in, in future, uh, in future uh, resilience to other crises. However, and I'm sorry to keep saying that one again and again and again. Not only viruses cross borders. Ukraine is one. The financial crisis was, crisis was another. So we need to go beyond preparing for viruses and, uh, and a possible pandemic like the AMR pandemic, which is the one that is, is around the corner, but also many other shocks. So that's going to be one of the key elements I would like to hear about today. Very briefly, very briefly, I think I'm running out of time, Susie, probably, how much I log? Two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes, okay, well, two and a half minutes, I can tell you lots of things if I speak even faster. <laughs> so, human resources, health workforce, we'll hear about that, there were three sets of strategies. This is one of the areas that excites me the most, I must confess, and I'm very pleased that you chose to put it together as one of the core elements for resilience. Uh, issues around the, the capacity, the training. The crisis is not new. The crisis with the human resource was there. Some counties have not yet recuperated of the shock of the crisis, of the financial crisis. We're still in some counties getting back some of, some of the levels of income, some of the conditions, but the shortages are there. And these shortages have been worsened massively uh, during COVID and, 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 and heightened some of the long-term problems that we are having uh, uh, 
uh, the, the Commission with uh, uh, their reports have been looking at some of the numbers as well as WHO on this crisis. The skill mix, an area I hope Matthias will be telling us about in a minute, uh, it's been fundamental during the crisis. We learn how teams could work much better together, how, sh how tasks were shift across teams. We we'll saw a real role of pharmacies, for instance. We're using pharmacies to sell drugs often, not drugs, pharmaceuticals and other stuff. Now they were actually helping with the prescri prescri prescribing. That's only one example, but there are many, many others. So how can we harness this dynamism of a skill mix for the future, also better ways to protect uh, our uh, health workforce, better ways to better financial incentives, but other mechanisms. Uh, so indeed, the, 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 the strengthening of the health workforce are still within the two minutes and a half, Susie. Okay. Treat me nicely, I'm the director. Okay, <laughs> good. So I'm going to jump, oh God, can you believe that? We prepare these slides and now them, and there is a time to to project them, they disappeared. Anyway, I remember that by heart. Whatever you don't see, I can tell what's in there. And they were nice, these slides this morning. I can promise you that. The more you prepare, I told you colleagues, the more you prepare, the, the worse things go. <laughs> Most of the slides are all messed up. Anyway, uh, from my office, it never happens when, from my desktop. So seriously now, in this slide that you don't see, and I don't see, but I remember them by heart, what it tries to tell you is there's a wide range of strategies within delivery in addition to the ones we'll hear today. Primary care got reivindicated, clearly it was there, but counties like the Netherlands, for instance, Spain and Slovenia with a strong primary care were able to control the pandemic much better. It's not true that it's only beds. It's not true that beds makes a difference. It's primary care combined with public health that made a huge difference. It's digital, as we'll be hearing about today is networks and development of guidelines. How often you saw, Dimi, how often you see hospitals working so quickly to develop new guidelines horizontally? Some would say it's because we let the hospitals to work, finally, and we didn't have them under so much control and develop new, new pathways. There was a lot of innovation that you could see. Ah, that you can see. So harnessing and implementing health system innovation is one of the key elements. I leave it here with, uh, that's not supposed to be deleted, the uh, uh, scaling up and the use of digital health and telemedicine. This is just a reminder, and I'm finishing here, Susie, uh, a reminder of the, of the increase in digital uh, mechanisms, particularly telemedicine. Interestingly enough, Germany is one of the lowest in, in the country, in the, in the region, and it's not necessary for the lack of infrastructure. It must be something else. This is a lot of the work I like to be hearing today and we're talking about. It's about implementation, it's about financial incentives, it's about regulation, it's not just about the technology and the new technologies. So a lot of that has to do with an aspect of the literacy and the culture and the management that is fundamental in implementing a lot of that reform. Thank you very much indeed. Back to you, Susie. Thank you, Giuseppe. Um, I have to say that we are now hoping to have Natasha Azapadi Muscat, who's the Director of Country Health Policies and Systems at WHO's Regional Office for Europe. And we have a connection problem, which explains some of Giuseppe's slide gremlins. There is no truth in the rumor that Giuseppe has deliberately disabled the connection to get an extra 10 minutes to speak to us. <laughs> simply not the case. Thank you. <laughs> Natasha was, of course, you know, going to tell us a little bit about the work of, of the region and pick up some of the themes that Giuseppe has already shared and I know has concerns particularly for access around um, financial protection, out-of-pockets payments and around workforce and mental health. Sadly, she cannot get online and the slides we will try and share with you later so that you get a chance to see what it is that she would have shared and instead and I think also just to one more thing she would clearly wanted to make a point about the public health connection and, and validity as a past president of UFA so now I think we'll just go straight to Maya please Maya Matthews is the head of um, performance of health systems at DG Sante in the European Commission and is working I think with WHO and also with the observatory and OECD on very much these issues Maya, over to you. The clicker's over here. Uh, I'm 
just looking for my slides. I think these are Natasha's. <laughs> now that is a good, that's a very good. <laughs> okay, okay, here's the, the EU blue, so I think that's me. Um, so good, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here at the Public Health Week. Um, public health is something very close to my heart. I've been working in public health for 25 years, and I just want to say how nice it is to see so many familiar faces in real life. You know, we've been living behind our screens, and it's really great that so many of you from Brussels and beyond are able to be here today. Um, today, I'm going, to give, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what the EU is doing, the EU's approach towards uh, resilient health systems. But I couldn't avoid but use this opportunity to share with you also some new data that we have from Eurostat that was only released last week on life expectancy and mortality that I think will also provide you with some research questions, I hope, uh, to the community out there. I think there's uh, rich pickings, um, but also to just give a kind of a context of, of where, where we're at at the moment in the EU. Um, but first, I wanted to just say that from the European Commission, resilience has been an important issue already since 2014. Uh, we did a communication on um, effective, accessible, and resilient health systems. And from one of the key issues coming out of that communication was the importance of having valid and reliable information. Information and data, as we've seen during the last two years, is absolutely key. And that's why one of the deliverables from this communication is a project that we've been working on since 2016 with the observatory and with OECD, uh, which we call State of Health in the EU. I think, I hope that many of you are familiar with it, but if not, I'm just going to quickly run through the main deliverables. And we have a report um, which is published every even year, so we had one in 2020, um, and this is, the o OECD works on this particularly, and in this report there are two thematic um, chapters which highlight some of the key challenges. So for example, the report in 2020 was about the resilience of health systems, about the pandemic, and also air pollution and health. And I can inform you today that the report that will be coming out in November, the two thematic chapters are on child and youth health and the impact of the pandemic on child and youth health and the importance of um, the non-COVID related care during the pandemic. And here, of course, we're looking at primary care, mental health services, and very importantly, digital health. Our digital health was accelerated. So we're very excited um, to, to have that report, which will be available in November. Then in every odd year, so last year we published in December 2021, 29 country health profiles. Um, and these are done in collaboration with the observatory and the OECD. And as you see on the, um, in the green box, resilience is part of that. So every country health profile goes through different, um, different chapters and resilience, accessibility and effectiveness are one of those chapters. And then to try to bring it all together, to try to synthesize this rich, rich information, we produce something called a companion report, which is a terrible name. And for the next cycle, I can say here, if anyone can think of a better name, please send it in to our team and we will, we will give you a prize of, I don't know, 50 copies of the next, uh, whatever it's called. But we're desperately trying to think of a, of, a, of a catchy good name which will actually reflect what the companion report is. And so I'll go seamlessly, oops, no, I've gone backwards. I'll go seamlessly to the companion report of 2021. And I'm showing this to you because I think that the, what we did was we looked at all of the 29 country profiles having been in many conferences discussing the pandemic. Um, we, it was a mixture of looking at the data and the facts and also listening to the, the policy concerns. And we came up with three um, key takeaway messages. And I just want to briefly list them here. And as Joseph said, I could speak for ages just on these three takeaways, but I won't do that. But um, the three takeaways were really, first, a reminder that we are still far from understanding the consequences of this pandemic in terms of health, but as we've heard, also other sectors, um, you know, welfare, social, environmental. We are still in the midst of this pandemic. We've seen now resurgence in the US. Um, and, and one of the three key issues I wanted to just mention under this is, first of all, 
long COVID or, or post COVID condition, um, we're still learning what this virus is doing to people, you know, uh, months, years after it's in, in their body. And uh, the European Commission has an expert panel, which we've asked them to produce a report uh, by the end of the year to try to look very much at the long COVID consequences um, for health systems. Do health systems, you know, how, how are health systems coping with this? That because of the vast numbers of people who are infected, who have been infected with um, this virus, what does that mean for health systems? The other issue, of course, is mental health. I think that's very important. We need to look very much at how we are delivering mental health, how we are, we are in promoting mental health. And the third issue is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, this, the non-medical, the non-COVID care. Um, what's happened to all of the missed diagnoses? What's happened to the disruption um, in chronic disease management? The second um, key takeaway, and that we're going to be hearing a lot about, so I won't go into it in detail, is of course what we saw during these last two years was a huge um, uh, uptake in digital innovation in healthcare. We've seen telemedicine, we've seen digital prescriptions. Um, I mean, here in Belgium, during the during the last two years now, you can only get a prescription online. When you go to the doctor, they don't give you a piece of paper. It goes in the system and you pick it up in the pharmacy. But another, the two points I wanted to make on this point was public health. Let's not forget about public health because I think the digital revolution in public health is extraordinary. And I think we really need to grasp that. Public health has been in the, in, in, at, it's at the forefront now. People know what epidemiology is. People all think they're epidemiologists. So let's really use this. Um, what we saw was also uh, incredible across Europe, as, as, um, as Joseph said, with the with the vaccine certificate, you know, that it was really used, we could use the same certificate was, was recognized across the EU and also other countries. And let's not also forget the tracing apps. So these are really important milestones. And in all of this chaos that we've been living in, let's not forget that some really great um, innovations have been made. And then the other thing is that before we get too carried away, I think it's really important that we evaluate all of these uh, digital technologies, that we need to look from the patient's perspective, we need to look from the payer's perspective, and we need to look from the health professional's perspective. Because at the moment, we don't even, I, I hope researchers out there are looking at, at actually what's happened and the fact that in some countries, you know, you had this, you had this huge teleconsultation wave and then pretty much a few months later, it was back to face-to-face. -face. So I think it's really important and exciting work. So to all the researchers out there, please look at this issue uh, because we really need to know because it's part of the transformation of health systems. And then the third uh, takeaway, as, as Joseph already said it very well, is we need to really focus on the health workforce. We've already known for many years in Europe that it's an aging workforce, um, that some of the skill mix and the roles were really not fit for purpose, not fit for what we're trying to promote, which is an effective, um, accessible, resilient health system with a good primary care network. So here it's really a plea that we really need to come together and to find ways to make the, the, the sector more attractive to young people. Uh, we need to look at skill mix and we need to look at um, ways to attract um, more young people to the profession and then to retain them. Because the, the ad hoc messages that I've been hearing is that actually a lot of young people are applying to uh, nursing and for medical school, but then after a few years, they're, they're leaving. So we need to find out what, what that is. Now I will share with you because it, it links to the first point I said about we better understanding what's going on. And so uh, Eurostat last week um, uh, uh, published provisional 2021 life expectancy figures. And my colleague who's sitting in the front row, and I want to give him all the credit, Federico, he's really great and he has managed to, to make these lovely graphs that I want to share with you today. And this is the first time anyone is seeing this. So this is a... This is a breaking news. <laughs> um, what we've seen now with life expectancy, we already know, because we've got the 2020 figures, that it's extraordinary and unprecedented that there was a decrease in all EU member states in life expectancy in 2020, except for two member states. And it's an average of 11 months. So that is huge. That's like one year of life lost. Now let's look what happens in 2021. Okay, and in 2021, we see a more heterogeneous scenario, but it's still quite telling 
because uh, some countries recovered. So you see it's positive. Oh, I'm looking. Um, yeah, so the different colors show you um, the, so green is, uh, green is 2020 and blue is 2021. So you saw the, the blue figure show, okay, there's some rebound, some, some countries managed to get back up, but other countries have actually gone down further. So we need to, again, to all the researchers out there, look into this. This is really interesting stuff, and we need to find out why. I wanted to particularly show um, that Germany, for example, had a reduction of 0.2, which isn't too much, but then it didn't rebound in 2021. Why is that? We know that Germany had good uh, vaccination coverage, that you know, in terms of mortality, it wasn't too high, the health systems were there. So, these are, I think, really interesting questions, and I, and I invite you to delve into them. Um, the other picture I wanted to show is that the mortality is, is not, um, you know, it's, it's not equal across the EU. We know in many areas we, we see this again, but I think this is also a stark visual to show you that in 2020, we saw excess mortality across the EU, and in 2021, we see it much more starkly in Eastern European countries. And so finally, when I was very excited to see these figures, and then I said, because I was still, still thinking, like, how can we explain this? So I asked Federico, is there some way that we can plot the kind of vaccine coverage with excess mortality? And so Federico obliged, and here's the results. And I think this is a very telling graph, and it shows you that the vaccine coverage, those countries with higher vaccine coverage also have less excess mortality. So... I think that this is a very, you know, if people, A, if people say, oh, COVID, um, you know, it doesn't, hasn't caused many deaths, it's just people who are already sick, etc. I think this excess mortality that we're showing you in life expectancy gives you a clear answer to that. And if people are saying to you, well, you know, how much is vaccine because people are getting it again and again, and, you know, how much is the vaccine um, protecting you? I think this is quite a strong graphic. So, again, I, I invite you all to, to look into this further, look into the countries. We've had discussions in my team about, you know, Malta has high coverage, but also has had a higher excess death. Why is that? Maybe about, it's about the aging population. But anyway, I, we wanted to share this information with you because we thought that this was the right place to do it in a, with an audience of public health researchers, people uh, that are passionate about trying to find better um, health, health in Europe. And so now I will move um, to providing you with a very short summary because I wanted to spend more time on this. So I, I will go very quickly through, and I think many of you already know this, about the EU's response to the pandemic. And in September 2020, um, Ursula von der Leyen, our president, really made a call for the need to build a, a European health union. And the European Health Union can be summarized in this graph. And so, uh, sorry, this slide. So we have um, basically already uh, adopted several policy initiatives. Uh, I think you've all heard, and Joseph already said that, about giving more, more strength and more uh, networking and coordination powers and, um, to our agencies, um, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, the European Medicines Agency, and then created a new authority the uh, European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority. And this is all to basically be better prepared for when the next crisis hits. Uh, we also um, adopted a pharmaceutical strategy because it's very important that Europe is really pushing and promoting the need for new pharmaceuticals that address unmet needs. We don't want more of the same. We need to really find ways for the industry to also uh, pr produce um, pharmaceuticals that help, uh, help people with diseases that at the moment um, don't have um, adequate treatment. And at the same time, we need to increase accessibility. There are many shortages. So this is the, the pharmaceutical strategy. And you will see, I think, clearly the links with the health system's resilience. We also have the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, which also leads to uh, better and collective intelligence to try to address this uh, very uh, mix of many, many different diseases. And finally, uh, just uh, earlier this month, the European Health Data Space proposal was adopted by the Commission, and this is the first of its kind. It's building an infrastructure, a regional infrastructure that will be able to link 
um, patients. So patients will be able to carry their own medical records to go from country to country. Um, and, and also, and I think very important for people in this audience, to be, have access to secondary um, uh, data so that you will be able to give us, from the European Commission and other policymakers, the, the crucial data that we need in our policy making. We also have funds. Oh. Can you see that? I can't see it. It's in white. Okay. Um, I, this is like a test like uh, Joseph had. Luckily, I have my slides here in front of me. But this is basically showing you the two boxes show you the green box is um, funding instruments from the European Union, which are transnational. So you work with more than one country. And the, um, I guess it's orange or light or beige box is, um, is uh, funding directly to member states. And I'm just going to briefly go through two of the main instruments. Yeah, I know I'm, I'm running out of them. So one is the EU for Health program that I think everyone probably knows about. It's the largest ever health program. It has four main pillars. One of them is strengthening health systems. And I wanted to just mention two projects that we're doing which re relate directly to the health systems. Um, uh, Joseph already mentioned um, we're working with OECD and the observatory in developing a methodology for member states to assess their own resilient capacity in their health systems. And it goes, again, beyond the pandemic. It's looking at all different types of shock, like climate change, um, financial shock, um, AMR, things like that. And then the second project I wanted to just also um, mention to you very briefly is on training, on continuous professional training for health workforce, and clinical and non-clinical, because in our discussions with professional associations, this was one of the gaps that they mentioned, that the funding uh, often was tied with uh, industry funding. And so we wanted to, to, do, to, to do this call for proposals. And as you see, it's 29 million euros. So we're hoping that we will get lots of good proposals. And we've left it very open so that many different organizations can apply. And they know best what the needs needs are of their own um, communities. And then finally, the, the, big, the big new kid on the block is the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Just briefly, this was a huge package that was put together as a direct consequence of the pandemic, but the aim was very forward-looking. The aim was not to just give, um, that, that, that countries should just go back to the where they were. It was really to build back better, to focus on the digital translation, uh, transition and the green transition. And health was also part of that. There's a six pillars of, of each, uh, of this facility and uh, health systems resilience was part of that. And as of the 15th of May, 24 plans have been endorsed. And when we do a rough calculation, about 38 billion euros, 38 billion euros are going specifically to health. And this is my last slide. And again, I have to thank Federico because he did, did something jazzy where I asked him, okay, let's look at the different plans. Um, how, how, do they, how do they stock up if you put the percentage of how much of these plans are actually going towards health? So each member state submits a plan, okay? And they can do whatever they like. They can, they can propose whatever they like in their plan. And so you'll see here, we've done the, the x-axis is basically the, um, the, the per capita amount from each of the, from each of the plans. And the, the y-axis is how much of that is going to, to health. And so you see a very heterogeneous, heterogeneous um, diverse view. But again, I invite all the researchers out there, if you're interested, there is the Recovery and Resilience Facility website on the European Commission's website, where you have each plan in detail. And there's even a thematic fact sheet on health. So I'm going to stop here. I really look forward to continuing the conversation and hearing from the panel about uh, how we can build uh, more resilient health systems and work on public health. Thank you very much. Maya, thanks very much. I, mean, I think we're a little tight on time, so I'm not going to comment. I'm just going to ask Dina Kazigas as the president of UFA. I know you have to leave Dean later, so if you could just say a few words now, that'd be lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not the president. I'm the executive director, but you know, it's fine, it's fine. Thank you, thank you for the compliment. Um, I wanna share some letters with you. So to be resilient health systems, build back better. But it all, we also need to be bolder. We need to say what we want. We need to stand up and say, Healthcare is very important. Public health is very important. Let's move forward. And we also need to be broader. It has to be the whole range. 
from individual prevention all the way to end-of-life care. The second letter is the E for equality and equity in healthcare. The R, obviously, resilience. The L is for learning, learning from evidence, which was already mentioned, but also having a learned and well-trained workforce. Then we come to the I, also mentioned, innovation. I'm looking at Anna, who will talk about digitalization. And investment is very important. And then finally, the N, networking working together, working with patients, working with the citizens, having community engagement. If you take these letters together, it spells Berlin. And that is where we're going to be for our European Public Health Conference in November, um, where we're going to talk exactly about that resilient health systems. So don't miss the opportunity to go there. It's from 9 to 12 of November in Berlin, in person, if all goes well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nika, thank you. That was, that was excellent. Um, I think now we're going to move, <laughs> we're going to move to the, to the panel discussion. And um, thank you panel for your patience. I know it's been a little slower than expected. What we're hoping is that Anna O'Donnell, Eva Bachinigan, Anna Sagan and Matthias Bismar will all contribute. We'll have a presentation each on access, workforce, and digital. And Anna Sagan is going to give a perspective that just ties everything back very, very briefly to resilience. After each one, we're going to stop, and we'd really like to have your contributions. We're not really looking for a question and answer, specifically more that you have some experiences to share, that you have some thoughts. And we'll do that topic, if you like, by topic, but very briefly. And then right at the end, we'll have a sort of slightly wider discussion. Can I ask speakers who want to contribute here in the room to put their hand up. Lisa will run around with um, a microphone. Um, could you please speak facing the panel? I know it's counterintuitive to keep your back to your colleagues, but that way the people who are online can see. Please keep your contribution to a minute. Um, and online, Erica is going to manage moderating it. She's already been keeping charge of the chat and keeping everybody involved and engaged. We hope that She'll group together some of the experiences and questions. We would prefer everybody online, please, to use the chat, but we will monitor the other channels just in case someone forgets. So if we can start now, I was going to come to Eva with the question. Basically, we've seen in the pandemic and through lots of the things that Maya mentioned and that Giselle mentioned before, that there have been real challenges around backlogs and massive reduced access. But there's also been improved access with new entry points. So can you give us a sense of the key messages for securing access and resilience? Well, uh, that's not a very simple question that uh, you can answer in uh, three minutes that I have, I think. Uh, but I do want to start with the access dimensions as they are. Because although we often think we have universal access in Europe, and we pride ourselves, especially compared to North America, that's not always true. Many countries in Europe do not have population coverage. We often do not have the right data to know, you know that certain groups of people fall between the cracks, are not covered, homeless people, for example. We also still have problems with benefits. Not every benefit basket covers all the services necessary. And we know this from very detailed work that we've been doing um, for the European Commission, uh, for the expert group on health system performance assessment, where we looked at certain um, the, you know, uh, treatments like stroke care, and we found that many countries do not, for example, have rehab um, reimbursed. So we have serious gaps there. We have serious gaps also in, 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 in financial coverage, meaning that, uh, you know, people have high o OOP leading to unmet need. So these all need to be addressed, and they were there before the pandemic, and they did not get better during the pandemic. But the largest, I think, challenge that we're seeing now is exactly the backlog which is affecting all the countries uh, to different degrees, that's true. Um, waiting times are going up as a result. We now also saw, thanks to the beautiful slides from, from Federico, <laughs> that mortality is, is going up, and that is, I think, also partly caused by these backlogs. I mean, we, this expectation was there, and now we have the proof. Um, and we need to realize that we, just by returning to previous levels of service provision, just by re-establishing the kind of access we had, that we will solve the problem. No, we will have to do more than we were doing before to be able to catch up. 
barriers between countries, but it's a huge problem. On top of this, we have perhaps a, a mental health crisis as well. It was already there before the pandemic, but during the pandem pandemic it worsened. Access to mental health services is inadequate in many countries, maybe all countries, and we need to think how we can solve that going forward. During the pandemic, we've seen lots of initiatives uh, that we can also use after the pandemic. Um, let me just focus on a few. If you think of improving productivity, capacity management and demand side policies, there is an opportunity here to, um, you know, look at which services need to be prioritized going forward. I'm sure that not all the services that we were providing before the pandemic hit us were all, um, well, necessary or, or effective. We can probably learn from that and perhaps there is ways that we don't need to uh, need to need to um, have um, we can introduce financial incentives as we've seen also now to clear backlog um, and also put money aside to do so we can also think of better spreading patients and using existing capacity that we have and some countries were better at it than others we can also go cross-border actually as we have seen during the pandemic why not only use that for COVID patients. We can use that for other patients too, especially you know where there's proximity, people living in border regions. Of course, IT plays a role, but that's a different uh, part of the discussion today. So I'll leave that. Um, and we need to then reinvest or invest in capital infrastructure and new models of care. Uh, if you want to have an accessible system, uh, ideally, people can access the health system at home primary care, outside the hospitals. There are all kinds of very nice population-based innovations already out there that are waiting and begging to be scaled up, and we just don't do it. And we have an historic opportunity here uh, to do so. Um, lastly, and no last point, uh, I don't want to sound like an ignoramus, so I'm going to mention the workforce, because that is the biggest bottleneck for all of this we can you know have the nicest plans but it's all about workforce 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 and supporting them but that's for later in this uh, discussion thank you very much Eva. we threatened him that if he said everything that matthias was going to say there would be issues afterwards <laughs> anna just a few kind of mini one minute reflections on how the things we've heard from Eva tie back uh, to the theme. Thank you, Susan. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, access uh, policies are uh, of paramount uh, importance and what um, countries have done to, uh, to support access in terms of uh, uh, introducing um, a supply uh, um, uh, policies, uh, service delivery policies is uh, very important but I wanted to zoom out to the level of the health system and just emphasize that um, access or any policies should be uh, seen not only in the context of the um, health system function in, in which they are embedded, so for access that will be service delivery. We should also look at other health system functions that are uh, crucially underpinning them. Uh, health systems are complex, they are uh, composed of uh, many elements and functions, and there are many uh, interconnections between them and many feedback loops. And we need a good understanding of, of, of this uh, to be able to better design and uh, effectively implement uh, policies. So for um, mobilizing, adapting, and um, uh, transforming uh, service delivery, we need at the same time uh, mobilize, adapt, transform uh, health workforce, uh, infrastructure, uh, financing. And all this is uh, underpinned by changes in um, regulation, um, legislation, um, effective coordination mentioned by Josep, um, um, uh, communication, and all the other things you saw on the governance slide that, that Josep presented. Um, uh, health systems governance is really uh, important. It's probably the most important health system function that really um, ties it all together. It enables um, all other system, health system functions such as delivery and, uh, and um, uh, resource generation and financing to operate as they are intended, but also in unison with another, in concert, uh, to produce uh, uh, the goal that we're after, the ultimate goal, which is improving our, uh, our health. Um, and to add to the complexity, health system is only one system. There are many uh, others. Um, and uh, finishing. Um, and um, 
Uh, social security uh, uh, networks have been super important during the pandemic. We have all seen that public health efforts uh, to, uh, uh, to control the spread of the virus through uh, fine test, uh, trace and isolate systems have often failed. Um, why? Because people who were supposed to um, isolate were not able to do so because they were not supported. Thank you. Um, thank you. I mean, I think it is important to be reminded of how all the access issues tie into governance and other sector work. At this point, it would be really nice if anybody from the floor has got a reflection or a contribution that they'd make, want to make. I was going to start maybe with Rita, if you had something, or Karina? No? Okay, then we go to... Yeah, here's... Very good. Thank you. Nicole's bringing the microphone. Rita, please. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, we have at European level the European pillar of social rights. It was not yet mentioned here. Do you hear me? No, no. Yeah? Okay. Um, and there is an article 16 in the pillar, which is a very good article on uh, that everybody has the right to access to healthcare. Um, I think it would be good to try to start an in-depth reflection on how this particular article of the pillar could be implemented at European level to ensure better access to healthcare. Thank you. Rita, thank you very much. Karina, did you want to jump in now? Boris. Coming, one second. Maya, do you want to come back on it? Hi. Boris Azais from uh, MSD. Um, so uh, first, I, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, congratulate uh, for for this. I mean, great panel. And I said what, what we heard from uh, from Maya is uh, shows how much you know the EU Health Union has potential. I mean, so it was very impressive. I, I will pr proselytize uh, your presentation uh, with my colleagues. Um, so take you know, coming from from the private sector, I just wanted to. Uh, to, uh, to ask, uh, you know, to, to make a, a, a very pragmatic point. When we're talking about resilience in engineering, when we're talking about resilience in supply chains and so forth, uh, it's you need to double the capacity. So that's the big question. You know, uh, what happens next when we're talking about resilience? Are health authorities ready to understand that you need idle capacity in order to be resilient? It's not going to uh, come up out of uh, thin air. Does anybody else want to add anything at this point? Before I ask Eva if you'd like to comment on Maya, perhaps on the Article 16 stuff, is there anything you want to add, Erica? I'm, I'm going I'm to hold off for a bit because most of it is workforce. Okay, <laughs> we will certainly come back to you. Maya, do you want to say anything around Article 16? Sorry, Nicole, Maya's here in the front row. Um, thank you. I'm not allowed to look behind, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that the audience can see. No, um, I'm very happy that, uh, that you mentioned the, the social pillar and uh, principle 16. And indeed, we are, we are doing some actions. I mean, again, and I didn't want to mention this, but I think we have to mention it, we have to recognize that um, health uh, is a member state competence. So we also have to look at what the EU can do. We have to reach out to member states. But from the EU perspective, I think what we are trying to do on the whole access issue is get the information. And so we're working actually now with the WHO office in Barcelona to really drill in to see, and this is again for, for researchers out there, what we don't have at the moment are figures about the effect of in-kind benefits on reducing poverty. We have a lot of figures about unemployment benefits, like cash, uh, cash benefits, but we don't have the in-kind benefits. So we're trying to now look at how we can try to get that, because I think that's also an important policy-making um, point that we have to make. How much um, health coverage, as, as Ewart said, it's not perfect in the EU, but there is a lot of health coverage. So if we actually have some figures and data about how much that helps if you have good coverage, and then you could even say, and how much more if you have dental coverage? How does that help? So those are issues that we're looking at, and we're working, as I said, with the WHO office um, in Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Boris, I think your point applies to every single one of the three things. So if you don't mind, we can discuss that perhaps at the end, because the resilience and the capacity is clearly something we will come back to for workforce, and we'll come back to for digital. No? It's, it's good. Ava? 
Is there anything you need to say before we shoot to the next one? Or just that I fully agree with uh, Rita and what you just said, and it's we should do a large European project that looks at all the dimensions of access, get the correct data so that we can compare countries and improve the situation. I think it's uh, overdue. Thank you, Eivald. Matthias, we come to you. The health workforce has been really incredibly adaptable throughout the pandemic, but faced and faces huge challenges. Um, can you give us some reflections on what we've learned and about meeting their needs better, about meeting wider needs and about improving sustainability? I think we have really learned a lot, Susie, but unfortunately the pandemic has sometimes been a very cruel teacher, actually. And if I sum up the lessons we've learned, I would say in three words, scale up, upskill and protect. And, you know, scaling up, we've seen immense effort during the pandemic to broaden the um, health workforce, to bring in to bring in um, retired people, inactive people. We've seen uh, attempts to include medical students, nursing students. And in a way, I have to say that fills me with hope that we continue with this and that we address long underlying persisting health issues, health systems issues, such as shortages. We have many countries that have still shortages, either doctors, nurses, sometimes maybe only specialities, and some countries look good on paper in headcounts, but in full-time equivalents, they are actually quite thin. And coming back to the capacity, I really think we need to invest in the capacity. Linked to this is the maldistribution issue. In some cases, we have great access to services in some parts of cities, but in remote and, re in, uh, remote, uh, and rural areas, it's much more difficult. And the uh, same actually also sometimes in big cities with deprived areas. And uh, there are means to do this and to address this. And linked to this, it sounds very boring, but we need to invest in health workforce planning and forecasting. I know there's a lot ongoing on the European level, and I can only hope that countries pick this up because this is, so to say, the bread and butter of uh, uh, scaling up the health workforce. And last but not least, when I talk about scaling up, Maya mentioned the European Health Union. We have a European labor market for health workers, but we have very little planning or monitoring for the health workforce. How many are in the pipeline? How many moving across borders? Where do they actually end up? And, you know, if a big country with a large, with a large labor market, an affluent country, is underproducing, that's a problem for small countries which are less affluent because they will be brain drained. So I think this is clearly uh, that we need to scale up. Upskilling, again, you know, during the pandemic, we have seen great advances and great agility in the health workforce. They were taking on new roles, new tasks, new st skills, working in completely different contexts, you know, fever clinics, whatsoever. And um, again, <laughs> I'm very hopeful about this, that we continue. And as a matter of fact, we have a couple of strategies for skill mix, for skills um, that have proven to be quite effective and where I only hope that this will be picked up and implemented. Like, for example, dedicated nursing roles in health promotion and prevention. Think about all the help patient needs also with regards to health literacy and the self-management. Patient navigators have demonstrated to be really useful guiding people with complex diseases through the maze of the health system. We have seen nurses and pharmacists in advanced roles. And I think this is really the way to go forward, even though it is, of course, politically sometimes very difficult. I've been vaccinated once actually by a nurse and the second time by a midwife, and it was good, you know, no complaints from my side. Um, teamwork. We all know that we have complex diseases. We need teamwork. Um, of course, digital is very important there. It's not at the moment in the shape we have. And last but not least, but I don't expand on this, Susie, I think that the wider health, first, work, health work, the wider workforce, social workers, policemen, firefighters, they all need a little bit of health competence as well. Final point, protect. I think we have seen that the health workforce was not only extremely valuable, but also very vulnerable at the same time. And we have seen this um, physically, in particular, in long-term care, um, personal protective equipment was missing. There was exhaustion in the health workforce. And of course, persistent issues such as uh, violence uh, against health workers is, is still there. And we need to address this. We need to protect them socially. You know, better salaries, childcare, 
uh, sick pay. In some countries, we don't have full sick pay, and then people are tempted to go to the to the hospital even if they if they are un unwell. And last but not least, I think the mental dimension has been demonstrated to be extremely important. We health workers were exposed to extreme distress, actually, to situations you don't want to, we don't want to, to face, burnout and all these kind of mental issues we really need to address and we need to invest in these working conditions. So thank you so much. Scale up, upskill, protect, I would say. <laughs> UUP. <I know. laughs> um, so just very briefly, I know we are kind of running short of time. Uh, I just wanted to zoom out again and uh, uh, kind of remind everybody of the importance of things that happen behind the scenes, behind the policies, They're all the wealth of policies that Matthias uh, explained uh, uh, in mobilizing, adapting and transforming health workforce. There's a lot of things that goes on to achieve that. And this includes um, lots of different things. For example, changes in regulation and legislation to uh, enable the health workers to take their new roles, for example, or in financing to incentivize them to uh, provide um, services differently, such as by using uh, digital health tools. Um, and uh, uh, other measures, such as uh, updating the training and education. So all of this is important with the crucial uh, importance of uh, governance, of uh, measures, of tying all this together and ensuring that all these elements come together to produce the desired policy. Um, and for resilience, uh, from a resilience per perspective, we really um, also need to think in the long term. So a lot of the measures that we have taken during the pandemic to mo mobilize and adapt uh, and transform workforce and now uh, to address the backlog of care, they have a cost. They have a cost of burnout, um, of stress, uh, of mol moral injury. And many health workers uh, have died, many have left uh, the workforce and many are planning to leave um, uh, for good. Um, so whatever we do now, such as focusing on access and backlog, we. At the same time, we need to take into account the long-term perspective and making sure that the health workers who deal with this backlog are uh, supported and that we retain those that we have and that we also um, uh, encourage new ones to join uh, the health workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Do we have any reflections from the floor? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, maybe, yes, you start at the back, why not? Um, Can you introduce yourself, Phil? <laughs> uh, certainly. Um, I'm Philip Hayward, and I'm representing the OECD here. And we're very pleased to be working with the EC and the Observatory on several projects that were mentioned beforehand. Um, I just have a couple of observations and then a question. So uh, it's been a great panel so far, and everything has uh, really hit home with what we've found as well. I just wanted to pick up on what Patiah said. Um, in our work, we've also found that the health workforce was supported quite strongly in many countries by the non-health workforce. And so that idea that we need to think about the training for that group, I think, is incredibly important. Um, I also wanted to pick up on one of the other points, which was the level of information that we have about the health workforce and the data that's kept on it. Many countries have also noted that that's an area that they really want to improve on because they were unsure about what's going on with their health workforce over time. Um, but I also wanted to throw down the challenge that uh, Danica uh, put out, which is one about equity. Um, we're beginning to get more and more information now about the maldistribution within countries, not just between countries, about the outcomes um, during the acute phase of the pandemic. And I think we're now beginning to collect some information that the same thing is happening in the recovery phase and the uh, restoration of the backlog. And I was just wondering if the panellists might want to comment on that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Penny Clark. I represent the trade unions in health and social care across Europe, EPSU, European Public Service Unions. And I actually will start with a nice catchy phrase we use in the unions, which is nothing about us without us. And uh, I think, you know, we have to not talk about workers as they, we are we, and uh, we are there across Europe. And we're talking about today the resilience of health, but we also need to look at the resilience of our collective bargaining systems, our social dialogue systems, our worker representation systems, and participation systems. Uh, Anna, you mentioned incentivizing workers, but the best way to bring workers into their work and into the service and 
you know, quality care is linked to quality work, is by involving them and actually integrating them into the decision making and bringing them with you about the restructuring and the changes that are needed. And we all realize that we do need to reinforce and strengthen our health care and social care. This is also part of the challenge of the healthcare system is to take a broader approach. And it's also been mentioned other sectors also contribute to ensuring uh, good health. I would just make a point too about um, fairness. We were very pleased, Maya, that in the Commission's definition of resilience, there is this concept of fairness at the heart, you no? Know, and uh, the colleague at the back has mentioned equity. Indeed, if equality and if human rights and if people are not at the center of the objective of where we're going, then, you know, this doesn't work. And it can't be, you know, it's not, it has to be planned, has been said, which means it's a public task. You know, we can only plan if we collectivize the risks and we collectivize the, 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 the responsibility to ensure that everybody, wherever they live, however they are, you know, in their income or in their geographical location, has as much access to good quality care as possible. And this will indeed need capacity, you know, staffing capacity. And we saw after 2008 the cuts were made in healthcare systems precisely because of this infiltration of a just-in-time logic, which means that you, you, you limit your possibility to have capacity. So we want to see, uh, as I said, more capacity, more attention to staff, and more attention to trade unions. And this is, has to be part of the starting point. Penny, thank you very much. I think we really hear what you're saying. Perhaps we could go to Sophie. Yes. Hello, Sophie Jerkins, KC. Um, I think that the motivation of healthcare worker is very important. And during the crisis here in Belgium, we had some survey to try to measure their satisfaction, their well-being. But I'm not sure the, the survey will continue after the crisis. And I think it will be very important to continue to measure their satisfaction and maybe at the European level to be able to compare this between countries. So having a monitoring on that uh, at uh, the European level will be important. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Just go to Kareem, perhaps at the back, and maybe to leave it. I know I, I will come back to you. I'm really conscious that Anna is going to talk to us about a digital, and we have a tiny slot at the end. So, Matthias, I'm going to squeeze your chance to respond, and we'll maybe come back to it afterwards. And again, for the online, I know that there's a lot. Sorry. Corinne, have a, a quick, quick, quick. Good morning. My name is Annabel Zebon from the. I'm so sorry. Oh, no problem. From uh, the European Doctors, the CPME. And thank you very much for inviting CPME this morning. This is a very interesting discussion. And thank you, Matthias, for very nicely summarizing the three issues. Uh, I want to also go back to capacity, as Penny just did, be, and the, the problem of that we have to move away from a just in uh, time approach to a just in case approach. And capacities for European doctors is one of the key elements for the future to look at. We think we should introduce benchmarks for minimum capacities for the workforce. So we need to have safe staffing levels, and to have safe staffing levels, we want to see minimum, a uh, defined minimum capacities for universal health coverage for normal times, let's say, but also for crisis times. And I want to hear your reflections about this. What do you think? It could be mirrored in a European semester format, for example. Um, of course, it's a it's very uh, challenging to define those um, minimum ratios. What are the minimum ca capacities needed and who's defining that? But we'd be interested to see these benchmarks in the future. Thank you for your reflections on this. Thank you very much, Annabelle. If I could, before we come to you, go to Erica online, because I think you have quite a lot of professionals also in the chat who are, who are looking to get in on this issue. Over. Yes, um, it's quite interesting because you've got a lot of doctors and nurses actually in the chat at the moment. Um, and it's been quite lively. One of the things that's come out is that this is very, all the issues that we're talking about here, they're global issues. Uh, we've got people talking about the situation in Belgium, but also Australia, New Zealand, um, and with issues around upskilling and how in some countries it's, there, there's a shortage of actually places for people who have been upskilled. So it's not just about the training, it's about making sure that once these nurses have, have had the extended training, that there is actually room for them in the health system to use those skills. Um, they've also been talking a lot about health literacy and patients, which is something else that hasn't come up very much. 
So, um, and, you know, roles for patient leaders, patient navigators, things like this. So quite a lot of stuff to respond to. Okay, I'm going to apologise to the people waiting to speak, Matthias, very briefly, and then we'll come to Anna. And then at the end, I hope we'll have a few minutes, and Caroline, certainly, I'll come to you then. Yes, maybe i just start with um, Penny, because that is very close to our heart. We believe that uh, during the pandemic, governance has been the single most important uh, lever to mobilise health system. And I think this is also true for the, for the past pandemic time, because um, if we want to bring in these skill mixes, if we want to um, scale up the health workforce, I think we really need to work on the governance and also see you know, how uh, nurses and other health professions have a better voice in, in this. Second, um, Sophie, you mentioned the satisfaction, and I just give you a little glimpse on our own, own, own research. Uh, we've done skill mix, um, skill mix analysis, um, overview, three categories, uh, outcomes, ec economics, and how satisfied were actually the health workers with the skill mix reforms? And guess where there was almost no information on the satisfaction? I think we need also in, in science expand on this uh, part of the stuff. Susie, do I still have uh, a moment? Really, 30 seconds, yes. and then we go to... Annabelle, Annabelle, thank you so much for the question. I think that these minimum standards work very well in countries, but between countries it will be quite uh, difficult because we have very different health systems still. Some are very hospital-centered, some are very primary care-centered. In some, we have a great skill mix, actually. In others, we have the skill mix of the 1950s. And this has implication that numbers not so easily can be transposed from one country to, the, to another. But uh, yes, in countries, I think that's a very good idea. I will stop us there. I know, Phil, you didn't get a complete response to your challenge and that we have other things to talk about, but it was really helpful. Thank you, Matthias. Anna Donny is in charge of digital health at Ufrand. is going to give us some reflections. Anna, I think that there has been massive digital uptake and an increase in telemedicine, but it's clearly uneven and very fragile in terms of progress. And so what about your sense of, or you for sense of the digital solutions to strengthen resilience? Over. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. I would start by facts. And very obvious fact is digitalization is permeating all aspects of society, including health. Another fact is this process has been accelerated by the pandemic uh, for controlling COVID, but also for taking care of non-COVID related health needs. And the third fact is that digitalization has a great potential to strengthen resilience. But, but prior to facts, I would focus on principles because all of us, we should be guided by principles. And from the public health perspective that I do represent uh, with UFA, uh, the principle is digitalization is not a name in itself, but an instrument, a tool to achieve public health goals. So in UFA, uh, and representing the public health community across Europe, we have been working on the concept of public health digitalization. And I'm glad that strengthening public health intervention has been identified as one of the 20 strategies to strengthen resilience by the observatory. And I'm glad that although the mandate is tiny at the European Commission, there is a program and a mission to, to, to reflect on public health. From the three perspectives, as Maya mentioned, the perspective of the patients, which in public health we call people and not patients, from the perspective of the system and from the perspective of the healthcare workers and healthcare professionals. As I was mentioning, with reference to successful strategy to build public health uh, digitalization in, in UFA, we have identified seven pillars for this to happen and to be implemented in true facts which is have political commitment at the national level, but also at the European level. And we have the example of the European data space. Uh, pillar number two is to have normative and regulatory frameworks to allow digitalization to be true part of health systems. Pillar number three is to rely on solid technical infrastructure. And this is the fact in some countries but not in others. And I bring the example of the Italian poor technical infrastructure to have digitalization in healthcare delivery. Uh, of course, economic investments, training and education, training and education of people accessing health through digital tools, but training and education of the workforce, uh, research, 
Uh, and I do not, I know we don't have time to go into details of that, but related to research is monitoring and evaluation. The process of digitalization has been accelerated, but I agree with Maya that we need research and monitoring evaluation to see what happens, what was successful and what was not. We have flourishing of initiatives, of offers from the private sector, but we do not have clear evidence and data of the impact and the effect of different digital tools to achieve public health goals, which are achieving population health and well-being. So in a nutshell, that's the perspective of uh, public health towards using digitalization as a tool to improve health. Thank you very much, Anna. Anna Sagan, I hope you'll forgive us if instead of getting you to reflect, we actually go for the last couple of minutes to get some inputs. Um, but again, I'm sure that Anna would want us to know that governance is very, very important. Do we have any reflections? Perhaps Levin, because I know I ignored you before, and then Caroline, and then Queenie, because I kept miscalling Annabelle for using your name. Three, and then we'll wrap up, I think. Even. Okay, thanks, Fuzia. So my name is Levin Draat, and I work at the Federal Ministry of Health in Belgium. And I, one brief comment. Uh, I think now is the right time to be very ambitious. Uh, and by being very ambitious, I think that at least we should have the ambition to put health system strengthening and resilience within the EU health union and not as something separate or next to the uh, EU health union concept. Uh, and we should all be advocating for this. Uh, but then secondly, it's also time for me to become more concrete uh, and to really say what we want. And by this, I mean, for example, capacity. Uh, we all say we need more capacity, but how much do we need? Uh, how much nurses uh, do we need in each country? How much doctors, how much hospital beds, uh, I see beds. Uh, I think it's time to be more, I become more principled, uh, more normative, uh, and saying to policy makers uh, where we should go to um, and move beyond uh, the concepts. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Levin. We'll go to Caroline now, and then we'll come to Karina. Thank you, Susie. Uh, my name is Caroline Kossongs, and I work for Eurohealthnet. And I would like to thank uh, you all for this uh, great event. And um, I wanted to, to reflect on the fact that health inequalities and the high level of chronic diseases have, uh, you know, mm, made COVID far more complex than it could have been. So for any future crisis, we need to make sure that we better focus on how we can tackle that best. And I want to uh, highlight indeed the great potential that the community has uh, and community workers, social workers, that was mentioned earlier also, to uh, help alleviate the burden of uh, primary healthcare workers and health professionals to deal with the complexity that comes with health inequalities and uh, people with chronic diseases. Um, there are innovative ways like social prescribing and working with link workers that have a great uh, overview of social and other activities in the community uh, that we can explore and uh, scale up and digital platforms here can be extremely useful to bring together all the various uh, support mechanisms that are there in the community to support uh, this group of patients and to make sure that we are all together more resilient for any future crisis. Thank you. If you pass it back to Karina, who's two rows behind you, that's great. There you go. I'm really sorry. I know that at the back there are lots of questions. I feel terribly, terribly guilty, Karina, to you. Okay. Hello. My name is Corinna Hartramf. I work for the um, um, umbrella organization of health insurance funds and health mutuals. And uh, I did a presentation about the, the reimbursement of telemedicine and uh, teleconsultations. What, and that uh, suddenly during the pandemic, it has been increased. And suddenly it was possible to be reimbursed, which was absolutely not the case before. And it was possible within weeks. So that was a good sign. And I was also surprised that it was possible. But I also realized that most of these things uh, had a limitation, a time limitation. So I think we should grasp the moment and should continue that we don't stop what has been possible. So I think that is important. And another aspect with, with what was mentioned also, um, but I think it should be mentioned even more, is uh, digital health literacy. Because uh, health technologies and everything is very important. It makes treatment better, is a, is a really great thing, and uh, we subscribe to it. 
but there's still a lot of, uh, you will be surprised if you see a statistics that a lot of people do not have access to internet. They don't know how to download an app. And I think it's impossible. Uh, it's, it's really necessary that we work on that because otherwise we do not only improve treatment and healthcare, but we also incre uh, improve, um, increase inequalities. And I think that is very important. And uh, when we take position to European Health Data Space, which we think are a lot of very, very nice initiatives, and we uh, were happy that we have seen an article about telemedicine in there because that was important for our members. So great achievement. But um, yeah, we should really discuss health digital health literacy. I, I think that's a, a very good point. And the point about equity is too. I'm going to take the thing you said before, which is grasp the moment. There is so much more to say. And I think one of the real advantages of being live is I hope everybody will join us for a drink afterwards. And we can really continue these conversations because I think there are lots of connections that we haven't been able to follow up at all. But before I ask Micah to, from UFA to close the meeting for us, just to say thank you very much. The technical team have struggled, as you have seen, but Deborah did a fantastic job running things, and Annalisa and Maurizio and all of the observatory team, and also the gentlemen from Brussels Video Crew who were very, very tolerant. Micah, everyone online, there will be a slide which will help you follow up with us. There are evaluation forms. I think we have three minutes, and I'm afraid it's not enough, but they're all yours. Over. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susie. And uh, thank you to the whole observatory for kicking off this Friday of the European Public Health Week and uh, helping us uh, start having a good start of this final day of the European Public Health Week. So we started on Monday uh, focusing on youth and health literacy. And this is the fourth edition of the European Public Health Week. Uh, we have 235 events organized this week. Uh, a lot of them online, one hybrid one, this one, <laughs> uh, and uh, almost 60 in-person events across the whole European region. Um, and um, to keep it short, so this week we focused on health through the life course, the theme of the European Public Health Week. Um, next year we will organize another European Public Health Week, seeing the success of this one with the support also of the European Commission and with all our partners. Again, mid-May, we don't have the day set yet, but around mid-May. Um, I want to highlight an event that is coming up later today at 3 p.m. Brussels time. It's uh, about Ukraine, something that's on our mind. Uh, for everyone. It's about building resilient uh, health systems and reflecting on the current state of the Ukrainian health system. Uh, you can find the information on our website. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining online and here and wishing you a good ending of the European Public Health Week 2022. Thank you. I think remarkably we're on time. So thank you everybody very, very much for attending. Please do stay and have a drink with us if you're in the room because I think there's so much to talk about.